Ignite Funding welcomes you to Straight Talk with the Director of Underwriting, Pat Vassar. So many times we get commonly asked questions about our underwriting standards at Ignite Funding. So we'd like to introduce Pat Vassar, who's going to go over the most commonly asked questions that we receive. Welcome, Pat Vassar. Hello, how are you doing? Very good. Let's start out by giving a little bit of your background, um, and let's make sure we also include your education in that background. Sure. Um... I guess that's one way to start. Just go over a little about me, right? Um, I come from uh, pretty much kind of a one-trick pony, all real estate back, all underwriting back, all in the Southwest. So I uh, grew up in Colorado, got a undergraduate degree from the University of Colorado in finance, as well as a minor in economics and real estate. Went on um, to become a real estate broker in the state of Colorado, more specifically Denver, uh, focusing on medical and office buildings in Denver, Colorado. Uh, that was uh, going quite well, but uh, want to go back and further my education. So I went back and got a master's degree in real estate from the University of Denver. After that, went on to first industrial REIT, which is a or was the third largest industrial REIT at the time. Um, again, focusing on underwriting and development projects all in the Southwest. Been doing that ever since. So the whole uh, 20 ish years. I've been doing underwriting in real estate. So when I say a one trick pony, I'm not exaggerating. That's really all I do and all I know. That's okay. That's all we need you to know. Perfect. And do. So let's let's kind of jump into this. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with kind of a series of questions that I'm gonna ask you and and have you answer in regards to how you uh, conduct the underwriting for Ignite funding. Sure. So we're gonna start with the first question. Is there a region in which Ignite Funding typically lends in more than others, and what drives that decision? There is, and it comes from a, a few different uh, factors. We primarily lend in the Southwest for a few reasons. One is it's our backyard. That's the area we know more than, more than others, really. Um, secondly, it comes from the way trust deeds are recorded and the way trust deeds, more importantly, are foreclosed upon. Um, in the Southwest, you can go through non-judicial non foreclosures and take the property back in the unlikely event that there is, an, is any issues with the borrower. We can get it back much quicker than we could in, say, Florida, for example, where it you do have to go through a judicial process and it does take much longer. In addition to that, we have found the most uh, advantageous drivers for real estate to be found in the Southwest, whether that's from an population growth, whether that's from demand coming from um, either more people like population growth, like I said, or from better jobs, more job growth in those areas. So we will continue to, to monitor that and we will move around where we see fit and where the market is going. We don't want to be um, reactive. We want to be proactive. So we'll continue to, to monitor those driving forces and um, our lending criteria and lending locations will obviously change depending on where the best uh, risk to reward is. Okay. The next question. Why does a borrower seek financing outside their established banking relationships? Um, borrowers tend to do that for a few reasons. One is they sometimes just become too big for small local banks and maybe too uh, small for the large national institutions. So there's kind of this niche and what we've seen is usually in the two to $5 million range where, like I said, they're too big for the small local banks yet not big enough for the national players um, that we've been able to thrive on and we'll hopefully continue to do that for decades to come. Next question. What is the matrix in determining the quality of the borrower? Quality of the borrower comes from a few drivers. Um, we look at their track record. We look at their capacity to take on new debt. And we look at their um, willingness to pay off their previous debts. Obviously, if there's a borrower that has come to us with a track record, we can easily go back and see how they uh, handled credit in the past, usually in the form of credit reports. Mm -hmm. That is usually a pretty good indicator of how they have handled and um, either successfully or unsuccessfully uh, debt in the past. And then we'll look at which, what I would argue is maybe even more important, and that's their capacity to take on new debt. If we were to give them a loan, do they have the financial wherewithal to make those monthly payments? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're really selling here is a, a convenient 
monthly stream of income for our investors. So we want to make sure the borrower has the capacity to make those payments. Okay. Next question. What is the matrix in determining the quality of the asset for residential and commercial property? We rely a lot on the USPAP standards, which stands for the Uniform Standard of Professional Appraisal Practice. Um, they determine what is kind of, uh, kind of the standards, really, for underwriting loans. And that is whether the property is legally permissible to be built, whether it's physically possible to be built, whether it is financially feasible to be constructed, and last and maybe more importantly or most importantly is, is if it is maximally productive. So let's start with that first one, legally permissible. What that really means is does the city allow for that type of use to be built? If you have a uh, property right next to a school, um, a lot of cities, most cities will not allow you to build a property that will enable, um, that will have a liquor license associated with that. So that's just obviously one in a very, uh, tons of different uh, probabilities or possibilities that uh, municipalities have as far as whether or not it is legal to build. The other is physically possible. If you've got a one acre piece of land, you're probably not going to be able to build a thousand single family detached houses. So we got to make sure schematically um, the property designed will fit on the plot of land that the borrower has or the borrower will be obtaining through our loan. Third is financially feasible. If you buy a property for a million dollars and it only generates $10 in annual income, would you ever want to do that? Well, of course not. So we want to make sure that financially it makes sense for the borrower. And lastly is maximally productive. Going back to the last example, if you buy it for a million dollars, if there is a way to generate a million dollars of cash flow on it, is that a good deal? Well, probably, but what if there's another way to generate $2 million of cash flow on that same million dollar asset? Wouldn't it make more sense to go down that $2 million road? Well, of course. So what we want to look at is to see what would make the most sense on that particular piece of land. Okay. Next question. What is the difference between loan to cost, loan to value, and loan to own? Loan to cost, loan to value, and loan to own um, are three completely different uh, valuation aspects to show how much equity the borrower has in a particular transaction. The L and the T are the same in all three. The only thing that differs is that last letter, and that last word of that acronym. The first is cost, which is simply the loan amount divided by the cost associated for that project. Now, costs are the hard and soft costs associated with the acquisition, the development, and ultimate construction of the asset. What would it cost to replicate the construction of what is already there? The second is loan to value. Um, again, it's the loan amount divided by the value. Now, value can come from three different sources, and these are de determined by independent third parties. One is the appraised value of the site. That is, if we were to go out and get an appraisal, what does the appraised value show? Second is the broker's opinion of value, the BPO. This is if we were to go out and talk to a licensed real estate broker, what would they value the property at? More importantly there is not necessarily what they value it at, but what they can sell it for. The third is the assessed value, and that is simply what does the county assess that property as, and that is an as-is value. Now, we don't use that valuation because it is an as-is value. What that means is what is the property worth today? What we have to look at in most instances is the as-if value. What will the property be worth once the development is completed or once the construction is done? So the end value, that was that what if value is what we really need to look in on. And the third way of valuing it is the loan to own. This mentality of where would we feel comfortable in owning the asset? If in the unlikely event, we had to go through a foreclosure process and take back the property due to delinquent payments or the inability from the borrower to sell the asset once it is constructed and the loan is now become due, if we had to foreclose, where would we feel comfortable owning the asset and ultimately selling it and returning 
the money to the investors. That is what the concept of loan to own is and one we really need to uh, make sure we have a good grasp of. What are the pros and cons of allowing interest reserve as part of the loan to the borrower? Interest reserve, um, well, first of all, what interest reserve is. Interest reserve is a predetermined amount of time that we require interest payments to be held by us to be disseminated to our investor, investors each and every month. Now, that interest reserve um, is sometimes required by us and sometimes not required by us. When we do require it, it is for typically, and this is not all cases, but typically it is because it's a new borrower and we are unsure um, how we're going to be able to get those payments, whether it's come, come from a check, a wire, an ACH, whatever the case may, case may be, we can ensure our invest, to our investors that we have those interest payments and they will be disseminated, disseminated to them on the first of every month or by the 10th of every month, month I should say. Um, so there is no hiccups. Sometimes when we don't require the interest reserve is because it would increase the loan to value too much. Keep in mind, anytime we do an interest reserve, that is um, funds that the borrower has to set aside to pay our investors. Most of the times they would rather do that every month. When those payments come due, have that those payments come out per month as opposed to per year. For example, on your mortgage, on your house, when you pay that, you pay it on a monthly basis. If the bank required you to make 12 months of payments all up front, most homeowners, would, A, wouldn't be able to do that, and B, would really have to look at whether or not it makes economic sense to take out that large of a loan anymore. So it really is a cash flow issue for the borrower. So sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Having it one way or the other doesn't increase or decrease risk so long as that loan to value does not increase due to the interest reserve. Next question. Why is a construction control account used and how do they reduce the risk to the investor? Um, construction control is, well, first of all, let's kind of go over what construction control is. It is a third party voucher control system that ensures money is not disseminated to the investor, excuse me, to the borrower until work has been performed. In layman's terms, what that means is Money is held by a third party, so third party not, not being Ignite Funding, not being the borrower, but a uninterested third party, and held until work is performed on that site. In theory, all work performed is increasing the, the value of that property. For example, if a property, if a home is being constructed and the there's no cabinets inside, if the borrower were to, were to buy cabinets and put cabinets in, that is less um, one less item a potential new buyer would have to do to that house to create value for that property. So it's it's worth something. And that, that something is predetermined between Ignite Funding and the borrower prior to originating the loan. When we set establish a budget, we send that to the third party. They hold on to it and uh, make sure, like I said, the work is done before they release that money um, to the subcontractors or to the borrower directly. Next question. How do you determine the duration of time the funds will be lent to the borrower and do you allow for extensions? I'll answer the second question first. Yes, we do allow for extensions. There are many times and um, if you are a borrower out there, you'll probably laugh at many times because it's pretty much every time there are unforeseen things that come up. Um, some of the some of the items we've seen is uh, they were digging for a foundation of a home and then came across Indian remains. Well, that delayed the project for many months while an archeologist came out there to examine the remains and examine um, whatever it was they found. So there are delays and we do allow for extensions. Now those extensions are predetermined prior to funding and advertised to our investors in the unlikely event they are utilized. There are no additional extensions on top of the ones that were already allotted to the borrower prior to funding. As far as how do we determine the amount of time that we will lend to a borrower, it is usually predicated off the amount of time we expect it to come to fruition. Um, there are usually three typical stages of uh, loan that we look at, and that is the acquisition, the development, and the construction, each of which, um, some of it runs concurrent to each other, 
um, but most of it with, of which you can't really overlap. There are very distinct times that you need to um, give the borrower in order for them to build or develop the site. The first is the acquisition phase. Not only is it the actual acquisition of the property, but it's also the entitlement of the property. Working with the local uh, city and counties to ensure that the tentative map will be approved into a final map. Um, the second phase is the development phase, and that's what we call the horizontal development. That is getting the raw land ready for construction. Um, that is everything from off-site impro off improvements um, to on-site improvements. Off-site improve off improvements would entail, uh, let's say, adding a stoplight to the nearest um, signal to ensure that your the increased uh, traffic flow due to your development will have the proper, proper ingress and egress for the site. Um, On-site development would consist of stubbing water and electrical power to each residential lot or to the commercial building. And then the third phase is the construction, the vertical construction. That is after the, the land has been transformed in fr from raw land into finished lots um, for the construction to actually happen, whether they're building single family homes, apartment buildings, or shopping malls. That is from ground level vertically. Next question, before a loan is made to the borrower, what requirements of the borrower must be met or produced to Ignite Funding? We require um, a few items. Most of them are required by the mortgage lending division here in the state of Nevada that have strict guidelines as to what needs to be disseminated, disseminated to our investors from the borrower. Those items would be the authorization to pull credit. We need to look into the, car, the borrower's credit history to ensure they have the credit um, awareness and the credit history that shows good, solid, history of on-time payments. The second is the most recent tax returns. We require the, uh, mo the two most recent tax returns. Most of our borrowers file extensions, so sometimes it's the previous three years tax returns, depending on the time of year in which we fund. Third is the preliminary title policy. Um, what we will do is take a look at the prelim um, and ensure that no liens, whether that is financial or otherwise, are on the property that we are um, not aware of. There are a lot of times where borrowers may have already begun work and there are mechanics liens on the property, or there are um, rights to the property that most of us are used to, like HOA rights. Um, whether you realize it or not, your HOA has seniority rights over your asset um, than you do. And so we just wanna make sure that those um, HOA documents are, are you know, really, really tight and we understand everything in them. Um, what we will also require is the borrower to obtain an insurance policy. In addition to that, we will ensure that the borrowers add our investors as an additionally insured to that insurance policy. That is uh, just one additional way we minim min mitigate risk for our investors is to include them on the insurance policy. Next question. Do you continue to monitor the progress of the residential or commercial property during the loan duration? Absolutely. Um, most of the time we fund the full life cycle of the project. Like we talked about previously, those three life cycles are the acquisition, the development, and the construction of the property. All the way through those life cycles, we are monitoring um, how, the prog how they are progressing and when they will need a new loan. We do it for our own benefit and we do it for the benefit of our, the investors. For our benefit is to know um, when the next loan is coming down the, the pipeline. If they are getting very close to finalizing a final map for the asset, we know they're gonna be coming to us looking for a development loan. If they're getting very close with the development of the property, we know they're gonna be very close to coming to us with a construction loan. We also do it on to look into the, the investor's best interest. We wanna ensure that if any money was set into construction control, that it is indeed being utilized for the development or for the construction of the asset. So not only do we rely on that third party voucher control system, but we also have an inspector go out there and inspect the site just to put another set of eyes on it. So we're not relying on just one person to ensure money is being used properly. Okay. <coughs> 
And for our final question, what advice would you give to a borrower who's seeking financing with Ignite Funding? For, for advice to potential borrowers, I would say become bankable. And what do I mean by that is we are not here to service the underserved in the market. We are not a, a, a subprime originator if we, if, uh, we were to equate that to a, uh, the residential side of things. What we are is we are a quicker version of the bank. We do not have as many um, stringent guidelines that we have to go by that take a lot of time. So really what we are is a quick and easy and convenient lending source for borrowers who could otherwise go to a bank. And the reason they would come to us is due to our, our quick nature. We can fund loans much, much quicker than banks. That doesn't mean we're funding worse loans than banks. That doesn't mean we're fi funding better loans than banks. We are just a different way for a borrower to utilize loans or get loans quicker than they otherwise would through normal uh, financial channels. Great. Is there anything that you think we've missed that we should cover? No, I don't think that, I think that pretty much sums it up. I don't think there's actually anything else um, either on an investor side or a borrower side that would really um, kind of go over what we're looking for out of the borrower and what investors should be looking for out of us in our investments. Okay, great. Thank you for joining us for Straight Talk with Pat Vassar, our Director of Underwriting at Ignite Funding. If you have any further questions about how we underwrite our loans at Ignite Funding or interested in becoming a borrower, please contact us directly.